pals. Before we jump into the video, I wanted to tell you guys about a really exciting event that I'm going to be hosting later this month. I'm teaming up with A Killer Party, which if you don't know, is a brand new musical murder mystery series that was shot in quarantine. It's starring literally all of your favorite Broadway superstars. You've got Jessica Kanan Wynn from Heathers, Drew Galing from Waitress, Jackie Burns, Christina Alabato, Michael James Scott, Laura Osnes, Jeremy Jordan, and so many more. Honestly, it's kind of a dream lineup. I'm not allowed to say too much about the event yet, but I can say that it's part screening of the series, part interactive slumber party. And the great thing about parties is that you never know who's going to crash. I'm gonna double check that guest list, but something tells me you guys are going to like my new friends. Tickets will be on sale soon and probably limited, so if you wanna get more info on the event, I'll have a link in the description box below. Anywho, here's the video. Hi, Spooky Spooky, and welcome to Spooky Season. I'm your host, Spooky Spooky. Today, we're going to be discussing why everybody hates Joanna, and a little bit of a nerdy rant on one of my favorite musicals, Sweeney Todd, The Demon Barber of Fleet Street. I have a big old poster of it right up here, but you can't see it because the camera cuts it off, but trust me, it exists. If this is your first time seeing my face, hi, my name is Kat, and I really like musicals. If you really like musicals, hit subscribe to join the musical theater internet cult. That's the best way to kick off spooky season, by joining a cult, because someone on the internet told you to. Question of the day, what is your favorite spooky themed musical? Beetlejuice, Little Shop of Horrors, Jekyll and Hyde, Lizzie, Young Frankenstein? Speak out about your fave in the comments down below. If I had to choose a spooky musical other than Sweeney, I think I would probably say the 2012 version of Carrie the Musical. I love that show, and let me tell you, I am dying to do it again. Anyone wants to cast me as Sue, call me. I will give you my personal phone number. Cast me as Sue Snell right now. Something worth noting, we're really going to be discussing Joanna's character through the lens of Sondheim's Sweeney Todd musical. Not so much String of Pearls, the Christopher Bond play, or the film adaptation. Even though there's a 99% chance that I probably used a movie still for the thumbnail of this video because there are no high quality photos of Anjanus. Why do you think Amanda Seyfried is in the Cosette thumbnail? I'm watching Big Love right now, so my mind is just Amanda Seyfried. I also wanted to mention spoiler alert because we will be discussing spoilers. I know this isn't a new show by any means, but it might be new to someone watching. So here are some of my assorted thoughts on Sweeney Todd. I grew up on the Angela Lansbury, George Hearn pro shot. There was this phase in middle school where instead of watching TV, I would just leave the DVD in the DVD player and just pick up Sweeney wherever I had last left it off, which in retrospect does kind of sound like a lot because it is, but I'm not gonna question my 11 year old logic. Just gonna keep watching the murder cannibal. Something I really love is how they build and establish the world of the show. You know, it really grips you from the first few notes. You have this ominous sense of foreboding. There's almost an adrenaline rush that comes from that opening. Like you are strapped in, you know this is the ride you are on tonight and sh is about to go down. A lot of really great horror movies kind of employ that same tactic. Usually in a pre credit scene, you'll get a little taste of what's to come you know, a preview of the antagonist doing something creepy or murdery. I feel like a lot of slasher films get a bad rap for being formulaic or maybe not having the best dialogue. And usually that's because they have so much exposition they need to lay out quickly. But with Sweeney, I feel like you get the best of both worlds. You get that horror movie action and engagement with some really incredible writing and music. I think you could probably make a case for a number of characters in this show living with some form of mental illness but I think it's kind of reductive and harmful if we just analyze the characters in that way, especially since it's never explicitly stated in the show. Furthermore, I'm a dumb dumb. Mental health is a big serious topic and one that I'm frankly not qualified to discuss. So if you're wondering where that section of analysis is, it isn't. I think me trying to diagnose very real illnesses to fictional characters is both arbitrary and offensive, so I'm gonna not. Regardless, I think that Joanna and the show as a whole is really contingent on the vision of the director. I feel like Sweeney Todd is one of those shows that gets completely reinvented with every new production of it. I've seen it performed in very full, classic, lavish ways. I've seen it pared down very minimalistically. I've seen it placed in a mental hospital. I've seen it modernized and the beggar woman is tripping and hallucinating the entire show. I saw the emergency 
immersive off-Broadway production that was running a couple of years ago, and no, I did not eat a meat pie. The show totally got in my head, and I got very freaked out at the thought of eating people meat, which I guess is a good thing. Like, I think I would be more concerned if I wasn't worried about eating people meet. Here are some of the most common complaints I've heard against Joanna. She's boring. You've got a show full of some of the most dynamic, interesting, crazy characters in the musical theater canon. And in comparison, she's just kind of there. You don't usually get an opportunity to root for a serial killer on Broadway, so why would you go for the normal one? She doesn't progress the show along. Obviously, she serves as a catalyst for the events going on, but she doesn't really do much herself. For a character who is constantly getting talked about, or sang about, she doesn't get to say very much. She's a damsel in distress. Just another blonde soprano in a tower getting rescued by a handsome tenor. She's also just like constantly in peril or freaking out. Like if you were playing Joanna and you made this face 90% of the time, you would probably be doing a pretty decent job at playing her. It's difficult to root for a character when 90% of the time you spend with them, they're just overwhelmed or surprised. Like that's her entire character. She's just surprised 24 seven. Surprise! There's a cute boy outside your window. Surprise, your dad wants to marry you. One of those surprises is like infinitely better than the other. I'm not gonna tell you which one though. And the number one complaint that I see against Joanna is that she's annoying. Like straight up, she's just annoying and kind of dumb. Her lines, her voice, everything. It's all bad. And admittedly, this is one that I kind of agree with. A lot of productions of Sweeney I've seen, Joanna is best case forgettable, worst case ridiculously awful and grating to the ear. It's a lot of very high, very loud singing, and I think a lot of singers choose to sacrifice character development and acting choices for the sake of the music, which in my opinion, you can't do, especially in a show where you have such little scene work or dialogue to make up for that. So now that we broke that down, let's discuss why I think Joanna is so interesting and so cool. First thing first, let's go ahead and get this bias out of the way. I like Joanna because I want to play her. I love Sweet Todd, I'm a legit soprano who ends up crying on stage in nearly every role I'm cast in. It's a natural fit. Let's break down everything else though. I don't think she's boring. I think she's human. The show sets up this precedent where you're rooting for a serial killer and a cannibal, so of course the normal teenage girl is going to seem less interesting. But I think that's what's so especially chilling about this show and this role. Teenage girls and young women are so often not taken seriously, whether that be in business, in leadership positions, in life or death slasher situations. It really bugs me how girls are so quickly discredited just across the board. That's another horror movie trope. A young woman pleading for help or almost escaping only to have someone who thinks they know better than her push her deeper into danger. Joanna is just your average teenage girl literally trapped in a horror movie. Actually, I kind of take that back. She's really trying to escape from four separate horror movies. Father figure who's trying to make a move on her. Wrongfully institutionalized. Commits murder out of self-defense and then goes on the run. Witnesses a murder and then goes into hiding. This poor girl, oh my God. We'll come back to this topic because we got a whole lot more to unpack there. I think Joanna's really strong. She remains hopeful and kind and curious even under really dark and dire circumstance. You know, that's a big reason why I really love characters like Cosette and Cinderella because I think it takes a really big person to choose to be kind even after growing up in a really difficult situation. Joanna might not be as well adjusted as some of our other heroines, but we're also watching a big chunk of her trauma unfold in real time. We only get to see her in her neutral, natural state in one song, Green Finch and Linnetbird. The rest of the show, she's just trying to not die or marry her dad. It's pretty telling about Joanna that she already already feels stifled and caged from the moment we meet her. She doesn't just want something new because she meets Anthony or because her caretaker has suddenly decided to wife her up. She wants more for herself from the get-go. She takes control of her own destiny. That takes a lot of courage to plan to escape from a scary domestic situation. Yeah, her first instinct is to drink poison, which is maybe not so great, but I think that it's interesting that she would rather play by her own rules than be a helpless, miserable bystander in some someone else's game. That's a lot more backbone than we usually see in ingenues. I've been ranting about this for such a long time that it got kind of dark, so I put on some lights. You know, it's kind of interesting going back to that first scene with Anthony and Sweeney at the very top of the show when they're kind of talking
talking about their outlooks on life. You know, Anthony is the sailor, this world traveler, and he's talking about how beautiful all these places are and how happy he is to be home. He's not afraid of the world. He's not cynical like Sweeney is, who by the end of act one has decided that literally no one is worthy of redemption and everyone should just die. Anthony's last name is literally Hope. So symbolically, Joanna is of course this bird in a gilded cage who longs to see the world beyond her bars and that is what Anthony promises her. But because she's trapped being this pawn in a game she knows nothing about, she has to endure the absolute worst nightmare version of growing up. There's that really great moment right when Anthony and Joanna meet for the first time where Anthony takes that bird cage and breaks it free, promising to set Joanna free. And that contrasted with the beetle just killing the bird, showing how disposable Joanna is in the eyes of other men, something just to be used and discarded. I think it really speaks to how dangerous her predicament is and how high the stakes are. Something else that I've always really liked about Joanna is, how do I put this delicately? <laughs> she wants Anthony to touch that little dangly dang that swang in the back of her throat. Especially with this fetishization of purity that is so important to Judge Turpin and also the rest of the world, even though it's 2020 and it would be so chill if we stopped putting pressure on female virginity. But I think so often we see ingenues through the lens of the male gaze, where they're this perfect pinnacle of femininity, aka they're pretty and nice, which are two of my least favorite words in the English dictionary especially when they are the sole adjectives given to a character. But I digress. Okay, so Joanna at the beginning of Kiss Me is very nervous and very preoccupied with escaping her fiance daddy or daddy fiance. You know, like Daddy Warbucks, except infinitely more creepy. About halfway through the song, she has this revelation and realizes how much fun making out is. And that's when she starts instigating it and escalating it. And I know that's such a small detail, but it is so major to me. She probably has a very skewed, very unhealthy view of sexuality. Think about how sheltered she is, the probable religious sexual guilt that is present in her life. And of course you can't forget about Judge Fiance Daddy, which by the way, how old were you the first time that you saw a production of Sweeney Todd that included mea culpa? Because the first time I saw it on stage, I was sitting between my parents. They didn't know the song existed. I didn't know it was going to be performed that night, but the second judge walked on stage, I knew what was coming. While I was putting this video together, I kept making jokes about how Joanna is just trying to escape the horror movie that is Sweeney. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized how much this show really lends itself to different horror movie tropes. When I was skimming through Finishing the Hat last night, I found a really interesting section where Sondheim tries to define what exactly Sweeney Todd is. Is it an operetta, a musical, a play with music? And ultimately he decides that Sweeney Todd is a movie for the stage. And that's when it all made sense and it just kind of hit me. I love Joanna because she's a final girl. If you don't know, final girl was a term created by Carol J. Clover and it refers to the last girl alive in a slasher film. Slasher is the subgenre of horror where a group of people meet their demise by a blade or blade-like instrument. Think like Friday the 13th or Nightmare on Elm Street. There's a couple of different requirements that final girls have to fulfill, so I thought it would be fun to see how Joanna fits into that. And yes, this is from Wikipedia. Please don't tell the teacher I'm citing this as a source. The slasher golden age was between the 1970s and the 1980s. Sweeney Todd premiered on Broadway in 1979. Final girls get the final confrontation with the villain. She either beats them or she escapes. So for Joanna, yes and no. In her first and final confrontation with Sweeney, he is ready to kill and she evades him. He still has another scene with Lovett, whom he kills, and Toby, who is not wholly victorious because he's pretty psychologically broken by the whole ordeal. Another requirement of the final girl trope is virginity, which courtesy of Judge Daddy Fiance, we get a whole creepy song about. There's this other really interesting aspect where the final girl gets to live because of her implied moral superiority. In modern horror movies, that means not partying or not being a bully. But in Sweeney, the lines are so much more clearly delineated because aside from her and Anthony, everyone else 
kind of sucks. Sweeney is murderous, Lovett is selfish, and doing some food tampering, to put it lightly. Turpin's a big old creep, the Beatles greedy, Toby's part of a scam, Pirelli's committing extortion and mistreating a kid, Beggar Woman is ostensibly engaging in sex work, which by horror movie standards won't make the cut. Sometimes the final girl has a shared history with the killer, which Joanna absolutely does because he's her daddy. Not in a creepy judge fiance way, just like a normal dad way. But I think the part of this trope that absolutely shocked me the most and absolutely convinced me that Joanna should count as a final girl, the unisex or masculine identity that she usually takes on in order to evade or finally beat the villain during her final confrontation. Carol J. Clover calls this, I kid you not, phallic appropriation. If you remember during Joanna's big final confrontation with Sweeney, she is literally disguised as a man. Usually when you're talking about phallic appropriation, they mean she picks up a knife or another not safe for work shaped weapon. But if that doesn't count as phallic appropriation, I don't know what does. Also, I'm gonna go ahead and never say the words phallic appropriation ever again. Phallic appropriation. In conclusion, those are my thoughts on Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street, and Joanna, my new favorite final girl. I wanna hear your thoughts on all of this in the comments down below. Do you think I'm giving Joanna way too much credit? Should she count as a final girl? Do you think Andy's version of Sweeney Todd was better on The Office? If you're new here, hit subscribe. You can also check out my second channel I just posted a really fun interview with Courtney Rhodes Reed. She originated Jasmine in Aladdin on Broadway. We had a great conversation talking about audition advice and her worst onstage mishaps. I'll link that down below if you haven't seen it yet. Stay tuned for more info on a killer party. That is going to be so much fun. I can't wait. I hope you guys are having a great day. I love you so, so much. Break a leg and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.